Hello and a very warm welcome and thank you very much for joining me this evening. Now I'm going to be talking, well more um, ranting, uh, about something that dominated my life for the best part of six years and that was writing a field guide to the world's whales, dolphins and porpoises. Now all naturalists use field guides, especially when we go somewhere new, to help us identify what we're looking at, learn a bit about it, but we tend to take them for granted. We don't think too much about what's involved in putting them together. And I think it would be true to say that most people can't imagine what it's like, you know, you're, when you're in the middle of writing a field guide, you lie in bed at night worrying about whether a particular species should be described as common or fairly common, or whether it's bluish grey or greyish blue, and there is a subtle difference, or whether its distribution includes this particular peninsula or that particular stretch of coast. But when you're putting together a field guide, these things seem to matter an awful lot. And now having been through the process, I feel really sorry for authors of, of other guides, especially when I hear comments like, you know, you can imagine the scene, you're on a, on a peninsula somewhere and there's somebody muttering away saying, look, the field guide says you don't get yellow bellied, sap sucking, ruby throated, bow legged, moustached warblers on this peninsula, but I'm looking at one right now and I feel for the author. Now I spent most of my, um, or much of my adult life working with cetaceans, whales, dolphins and porpoises. And I have to say with lockdowns and what have you, this is by far the longest I've ever been without seeing one out in the wild. And I'm getting serious withdrawal symptoms. I, I really, really miss them. And to be honest, I don't understand why everybody doesn't feel the same way, why everyone isn't obsessed with them. They're truly extraordinary animals. Even after all these years, they still blow my mind and surprise me every time. I'm going to give you a few examples. They include the deepest diving mammal, the sperm whale, which holds the world depth record. This is the deepest one's ever been recorded diving to at 3,193 metres. And until recently, the sperm whale also held the record for the longest dive, two hours, 18 minutes. But a few months ago, even that phenomenal record was beaten by a Cuvier's beach whale, which stayed underwater on one dive for three hours, 42 minutes. That's an air breathing mammal like us holding its breath. It's quite phenomenal. Three hours, 42 minutes. I think another one of the great appeals, certainly for me, about whales and dolphins is that they're shrouded in mystery. We know amazingly little about them. We imagine a big jigsaw puzzle. We've just put together a few of the pieces. Our knowledge really has progressed from virtually nothing to just a little bit in the decades of whale research. Well, I have to say in recent years, you know, we've got the help of space age technology, everything from satellites in space to Miami-like DNA, DNA research. And our knowledge is now progressing in leaps and bounds. It's a very exciting time to be involved in whale research as one surprise, one discovery after another. But it, it's by no means easy. I mean, not least because they spend most of their lives out of sight underwater. What we see at the surface is literally just the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. So if you think about it, once a sperm whale dives out of sight, what does it get up to? Where does it go? Is it on its own? Is it with other sperm whales? You know, we can't follow it to those kind of depths. We can't see it, of course, because it's too dark. I mean, we can listen to it underwater with a hydrophone or an underwater microphone, but that, that's all very well said and done. Yeah, that's like dangling a, 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 a microphone from the top of the Empire State Building and trying to work out what's going on in Manhattan below. You can hear them, but what are they doing? Another one of the, the, the great things for me about them is that they include some of the longest lived animals on the planet. And one whale in particular, the bowhead, is thought to be the longest lived mammal. Now this, this shot shows a, a fantastic encounter I had with a group of people. We're on our way um, back south from Wrangell Island, one of my favorite places on the planet in the Russian Arctic a couple of years ago. And we were traveling along at sea and we, we literally stumbled upon hundreds of whales, humpback whales, grey whales and bowheads. 
Now, bowheads we know regularly live to at least 100 years old, and you can actually measure the age of whales, various techniques, and they're pretty tried and tested. And the oldest actually measured was one that was 211 years old. And that was that had been killed by Aboriginal whalers. And at the time it was fit and healthy. So who knows, it could have lived for a lot longer, a few years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, we'll never know. But recent research published just a few months ago using a lifespan estimator based on a well, very complex DNA studies estimates that the maximum lifespan of the bowhead is 268 years. And again, this is a mammal like us. And on top of all that, the many, many reasons for loving and being fascinated by whales and dolphins, but I suppose one of the obvious ones is they include the largest animal on the planet. In fact, it's the largest animal ever known to have existed on earth, no less, the blue whale. Now, blue whale, the, the longest ever measured was a length of 33.58 meters. That's roughly the length of a Boeing 737. That's a blue whale. And it eats, an average size blue whale, eats the equivalent, this is in terms of weight, of a fully grown African elephant every day. That's four tons every day. Now, they also include some of the friendliest and most inquisitive animals on the planet. This is a, a friendly gray whale in a magical place, San Ignacio Lagoon in Baja California on the Pacific coast of Mexico, where it, it really is often quite hard to tell who is supposed to be watching who. And the remarkable thing here is that the gray whales have, I think there's this willingness to forgive and forget you got to think about what happened in the past. They were hunted ruthlessly by us in the second half of the, the 19th century and again in the early 20th century. And Yankee whalers used to enter the, the, the lagoon, San Ignacio and other Baja breeding lagoons in small wooden rowing boats. And they would harpoon particularly grey whale calves, knowing that their mothers would come within range to protect them. And protect them they did. They chased the whalers' boats. They lifted them out of the, water, out of the water, you know, like big rubber ducks. They rammed them with their heads. They dashed them to pieces with their tails. But despite their, 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 their very best efforts to fight back, they were hunted to the verge of extinction. And it's only because of, of official and, and effective protection in the nick of time, literally at the 11th hour, that they've made a remarkable comeback in the years since. And they're now probably at the same sort of population level they were before whaling began. But what, what's amazing to me, and it sends a shiver down my spine, is that nowadays those very same grey whales, once notorious for that ferocity in the face of danger, positively welcome whale watching tourists into their breeding lagoons. Somehow they seem to understand that nowadays we come in peace and far from smashing our small boats to smithereens and our whale watching boats are about the same size as the old whaling boats. They welcome us with open, well, open flippers. I was going to say arms, open flippers. And, you know, we don't really deserve it, but they've forgiven us for all those years of greed and recklessness and cruelty. And they trust us when I, I wonder if we really deserve to be trusted. Here's another shot. This is a mother and a calf grey whale alongside a larger vessel, vessel in um, San Ignacio Lagoon. And the calf's actually being brushed with a regular brush by one of the crew members. And it lies there, lifts its flipper up, brushed under its flipper, rolls onto its back, brushed on its tummy, and it loves it. And they come alongside and they'll hang around, hang out with us, sometimes for an hour or more at a time. Um, they're just spectacular animals to watch. This is a completely different sort of view. This is a feeding fin whale, which I took using a drone again in Mexico. I mean, you've got to be a lump of rock not to be moved by a sight like that. They're fantastic animals. So how do you go about writing a field guide about them? Well, I wrote a simple field guide um, 25 years ago. This, this particular one was published in 1995. And I guess, sadly, I didn't learn the lesson even then, never, ever, ever, ever write a field guide because I've now gone and done it again. At the time, there was nothing much out there. It filled quite a big niche, but it was in the early days of whale research. And our knowledge then was, was pitifully small. A lot of it was guesswork and uh, 
piecing bits together from talking to people who'd happened to have seen a species no one else, else has seen in the wild and so on. We've learned so much more in the intervening years and so much has changed. And in fact, so much so that the guide has become seriously out of date. And in fact, when that guide was published in 1995, it included only 76 species. And the one I've just finished, the latest one, includes no fewer than 90 species. Now that's partly because we have genuinely discovered quite a few new ones. I mean, amazing really, we're still discovering new whale species. And it's partly because we've split some other ones based on genetic research. So for example, the minke whale has been split into the common minke whale and the Antarctic minke whale. Well, um, the brooder's whale has been split into brooder's whale and Amura's whale. And so it goes on. In fact, I have to say this old guide is so embarrassingly out of date now that if I do happen to find it in a bookshop, I hide it in the cookery section and hope no one's going to find it. So anyway, a new guide was desperately needed and I, I duly signed a, a contract with my publisher. It's all great fun. You have lunch with your agent and lunch with your publisher and everyone raves about how wonderful this new guide's going to be and what a big niche it fills. And, you know, my publishers, Bloomsbury, and they, they all very enthusiastic, keen naturalists. And it was all great. So I signed the contract. Now, this is the gist of the contract. This is my sort of personal summary of it in case you can't read it because it's too small on your screen. I'm going to read it for you. Um, I promise to spend the next five years, actually it was six, working seven days a week, 20 hours a day on a whale, dolphin and porpoise field guide, giving up all my free time without taking holidays allowing only one hour to eat lunch on Christmas Day without complaining in any way. Now, I guess I've missed, uh, well, I missed the original deadline for five by five years. Um, and I've obviously broken the contract by complaining. But anyway, be that as it may. It reminds me, I wrote a book years ago called Last Chance to See with um, Douglas Adams of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy fame. And he taught me very well about missing deadlines. He had a wonderful quote, I'm sure you've heard. He said, I love deadlines. I love the whooshing sound they make as they fly by. Now, of course, when you're writing a book on this scale, the trick is to put off the actual writing for as long as possible. So first of all, we worked on the cover. Any excuse not to put pen to paper or finger to keyboard. Um, and we tried dozens of different ideas, as you do, until we plumped for the one bottom right. And I, I should say, in the end, we decided we we're going to produce two books, a handbook, which is out, um, which is, which is, I mean, when I look at that, I feel ill. There's so much work involved, 300,000 words, 1,000 illustrations, hundreds of distribution maps, everything you could possibly want to know about every species. And then, because that turned out, it had to be so big, bit too big to take into the field. We're now working on a, a smaller, more concise, sort of more pocket friendly field guide that, that literally can go in a pocket and can go with you when you go out on a, on a boat or on a whale watching trip. So we chose the cover, then the real work began. The first thing I had to do was to work out the contents. Now, the skeleton of the, of, of the book, the skeleton. Now, this sounds simple, but, you know, deciding what to include in terms of non-species text and species text is actually really difficult. So non-species text is everything from whale parasites, because they can often be quite useful for identification. And, you know, you look at a whale with something dangling on its dorsal fin, you want to know what it is. Um, and whale conservation, which, of course, is important, all the way through to ocean by ocean quick ID guides to help with quick identification and so on. So... For example, here's a spread showing all the species you might see bow riding in front of your boat to help with at a glance identification. It looks really straightforward, but the number of hours to A, decide which species to include, you know, which really do genuinely bow ride and which don't and which do occasionally and should you include them and so on. And then do we include the bow of the boat? Do we have the blue sea or a white background? What order do we put them in? I mean, at the end of the day, I guess some of it doesn't matter, but you spend hours and hours worrying and, and uh, stressing about this kind of thing. Here's another one. This 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 spread. Um, it wasn't. It's not actually a spread in the book, but each blow is with each species in the book, and putting together these blows or spouts was another phenomenal task. I mean, the idea is you can compare the size and the shape, and the density 
of whale blows and it's a fantastic way of identifying many of the larger species especially on a calm day when the wind doesn't blow the the, the spout out of shape you can actually spot a whale blow often miles away and even if you can't see the whale itself you can identify which species it is so it's an incredibly useful identification feature but had to analyze literally thousands of photographs and videos and referring to my old uh, my own field notes over decades to work out the size and the shape and the density of each blow and each species in ideal conditions and of course some of them have different blows depending on whether they've been on a deep dive or a shallow dive and all that kind of thing so I had to take all that into account so just the blows felt like a, a lifetime project then next thing was to decide which species to include now that also sounds ridiculous, I know, because surely you just include humpback whale, killer whale, bottlenose dolphin, harbour porpoise, and so on. Easy. But it, it's really not, because the, the number of species of whales, dolphins, and porpoises uh, that's accepted by the scientific community is in a, a constant state of flux. It, it's definitely not set in stone. You know, there's more and more work's being done in the field, and there are more genetic studies conducted in the lab our understanding of what constitutes a distinct species is changing all the time. So, as I said at the beginning, species are being combined. Uh, you know, there's currently, for example, only one official species of common dolphin, um, when it was considered to be two species when I wrote the first guide 25 years ago. Um, and they may well be split again into different species in years to come. And that doesn't even take into account the hundreds of subspecies and geographical variations there are altogether that have to be included in the guide. So I spent countless months corresponding and talking with hundreds of experts around the world, working out what to include and what not to include. Now, the ultimate authority for this is the Society for Marine Mammalogy. And as we were going to press, it hadn't made a final decision about one particular whale. And that to me looked likely to be a brand new species. Its existence had been speculated for more than 70 years. In fact, there were reported sightings by Japanese whalers in the Southern Sea of Okhotsk and eight specimens from the Sea of Okhotsk and the Bering Sea. And very little other evidence. No scientists had ever seen one alive and, and been sure of seeing one alive. Um, but having talked to everybody and discussed it and analyzed all the evidence, I did decide to include it as a separate species, the 90th in the book. And I'm really glad I did because I'm not kidding, a month after publication, it was officially named and it's been called Sato's Beaked Whale, Baradius Minimus. And that is the officially the 90th species of whale. So I'm glad I included it. I have to say identifying a new species of whale is definitely nowhere near as simple as it was bizarrely implied by that recent brief sighting of some whales off the coast of Baja just before Christmas, where there's a bit of video and, and sighting at sea. It just doesn't work like that. You know, actually being sure that you have a brand new species of whale involves years or decades of work, painstaking work involving lots of people, scientific papers, discussions, um, and final decisions. And you can't just say, oh, look, there's something a bit different. We don't recognize what it is. It's a new species. But it got picked up by the press all over the world and, and a bit frustrated that nobody questioned it. Anyway, um, I work with three artists on the book. The main one, Martin Cam, works here in the UK. And the gaps were filled by Rebecca Robinson in Australia and Tony Lobet, uh, who lives in Spain. And we all spent countless hours discussing every single illustration and I, I pulled together sourcing references photographs and videos and field notes and went through every single illustration that was going to appear in the book with the relevant artist and uh, talked about all the features needed to be included all the variations all the you know upper sides and undersides and everything else and um, they then went away and spent much of that five six years just sitting in studios. Martin particularly didn't really leave his studio for all those years and produced some amazing artwork. So after a while, you've done all your briefings for a couple of species, say, and the lovely artwork then starts to arrive in the post. So these are some of Martin's exquisite watercolours. Uh, these are of a Takushi kind of dolphin and a Guiana dolphin. 
I've got to be very careful with the artwork because this is what it looks like when you spill an espresso on a Takushi, sorry, Martin. And if you spill an Americano on a beautiful melon headed whale, this is what that looks like. You've got to be really careful. They were the only accidents got away with it, even though they're spread out my, my desk the whole time. So each piece of artwork then had to be scanned, which I did, and prepared for print. And it's a matter of looking at every single minute detail, checking the shape of the dorsal fin is correct, the length of the beak is exactly right and in proportion with the body, the markings are just right, any scarring looks right, matches what it should match, um, the proportions are correct, every single detail is checked. And then with the artist's permission, of course, I made any minor corrections or adjustments to those pieces of artwork in Photoshop. And as I said earlier, there were more than a thousand pieces of artwork altogether. And it's not just a matter of having one side image for each species. We wanted to show the upper side and the underside, we wanted to show the male and the female, especially because in many species they look quite different. Um, the juvenile and the immature and the calf, because they change as they grow older, any particular subspecies, uh, any geographical variations, any individual variations. I mean, some species vary enormously from individual to individual, so much so that you can actually identify individual whales or dolphins by how they look so different. Um, and wanted to illustrate any exceptional behavior and all that kind of thing. And that was an involved process. I mean, here's, here's a bit of an example. These are all different types of killer whale or orca. They call them ecotypes, which I think is a, a fantastic term. The term ecotype is very, very clever because it's used for ecologically distinct forms or populations that don't interbreed. Even if they inhabit the same waters, um, they don't actually interbreed. And killer whale ecotypes are actually quite different from one another. So they, they typically have different seasonal distribution patterns, uh, different social structures, behavior. They eat different things. They have different habitat preferences and vocal repertoires are different. So you can actually recognize them by their sounds as well. And, and they differ in appearance too, as you can see in this slide. And by calling them ecotypes, I think that very neatly reflects the scientific uncertainty about killer whale taxonomy. So no one's rushed into calling them all distinct species, although that may be the case in the future. Some may be recognized as distinct species and killer whale may be split. That's under constant debate, um, but they've just got these neat ecotypes. So here are six of at least 40 recognized killer whale ecotypes, all from the Antarctic. Actually, I should say there's, there's one doubled up. So the, the killer whale that's on the bottom left and the one on the top right are both members of the same ecotype. They're called pack ice or large type B killer whales. Um, it's just that the yellow one on the top right is covered in a layer of diatoms, which is quite common, especially in Antarctic waters. And that is genuinely how they look. They look quite yellowy orange. So they've got to be in the book, you know, because otherwise somebody's going to go to the Antarctic and they'll see a yellow killer whale and think, oh my God, we've discovered a new species and it'll be all over the press and everyone will report new species of killer whale. And of course it's not at all. It's just that layer of, of diatoms. So they're in the book as well. And it just makes sure that everything's there that you might see. And what might appear to be quite simple diagrams um, like, like these, for example, um, also took countless hours to get right. So just to run through what these are, give you an idea, you've got resting or logging outline of the of dwarf sperm whale above and the pygmy sperm whale, the one below. And it's a very, well, it's quite subtle, but it, once you get your eye in, it's a very different shape back. So the dwarf sperm whale looks like a, an upside down surfboard. So if you see it at a distance, silhouetted, you can tell it's a dwarf sperm whale because it's got a straight back, pygmy sperm whale, is a much more rounded back. Now then you've also got the dive sequence of a common minke whale. Now that's also very important, great identification feature for particularly the large whales, but for other species as well. So with a minke whale, the point, what you, the thing you're looking for is the pointed tip of the rostrum, the snout, always breaks the surface first before the rest of the whale. And it comes out at an angle typically of between 20 and 40 degrees. So by, by analyzing how they all surface and then representing it in these diagrams is another 
hopefully useful identification feature. And the other thing you can see there is that the saddle patches, these are the, the more or less saddle shaped markings behind the dorsal fins of killer whales. And these are from the three ecotypes of killer whale in the East and North Pacific. And it's one of the ways you can identify which ecotype you're looking at by the shape of the saddle patches and whether there's what's called open or closed. But you can imagine, you know, just for those few diagrams, all the hours of studying field notes and videos and photographs to get these exactly right, to recognize those subtle differences between species and then, then represent them as accurately as you possibly can. So some of the art was, artwork was actually prepared as, as digital originals um, on the computer, no paint or uh, paintbrush involved. These are spade toothed whales. That's the male above and the female below. And they've been done in a style by Tony Lobet in Spain that I think I, I think sits perfectly next to the watercolors that, that Martin Cam has been doing. And I think unless you're looking for it, you probably wouldn't notice the difference. It's an amazing skill, amazing style, and th that all done on the computer. So I included some photographs in the handbook version. The, the field guide is actually going to be all artwork just to keep it smaller. So here's a few shots from the guide, some more interesting species. That's the um, tusk of a narwhal, a male narwhal. And uh, the, the tusk is actually an upper canine, and that erupts when the animal's about two or three years old. It penetrates the upper lip, and then it spirals out counterclockwise, and it just grows continuously. Um, and for a long time, there's been a lot of debate about what, what on earth is it for? It's the most extraordinary thing. You know, nothing else has got one. So why do male narwhal have them? And there's have been some, some weird and wonderful theories over the years. One was it's used to drill holes in the ice. So you can imagine, because it spirals, you can imagine the narwhal pokes the tip into the ice and then spins around and drills a hole. But, you know, that, obviously that's not true. And um, what's it doing that for anyway? Um, just a little hole is not going to help anything. Another idea is maybe it's used for spearing fish but you just got to think that through spears fish on the end of the of the tusk it's got to have a very long tongue to try to get the fish off so that's highly unlikely although they have been seen stunning fish you know switching swishing the head from side to side and whacking fish with the with the tusk and they, they they're fighting as well is another theory and there have been narwhal found with broken off bits of tusk stuck in them as if they have been fighting. But I think the clue is the fact that it's, with a few exceptions, only the males that have the tusks, a few females do grow them, only the males. And so what we think now is they're like a secondary sexual characteristic, like the antlers of a stag. Now also on this uh, slide, we've got the Yangtze River dolphin, which is interesting because it's the first cetacean, as far as we know, to, to become extinct in historical times and it became functionally extinct in 2007. It used to live in the Yangtze River in China and uh, this, this photograph actually is one of the, is, I'm one of the few people in the world with photographs of Yangtze River dolphins. That's our only record, just those few images, me and a couple of other people, um, that the, the species existed. Terrible that it went, we haven't learned the lesson, I have to say it won't be the last to go. Um, if I had to pick the one most likely to go extinct next, I would say it's a, a, a little animal called the vaquita, which is a delightful little porpoise that's hanging on by a thread in Western Mexico. Um, it may not survive until the end of this year. There are possibly fewer than 10 of them left. And while nobody's given up, the future looks pretty bleak. So maybe, although I doubt, we'll learn the lessons after that one. Um, there's also a picture of a, a harbour porpoise up in the top right there. That's fairly common porpoise. We get them around the coast of the UK. Best place for them is off Western Scotland. Lots of them there. Um, although they're struggling, they get caught in fishing nets a lot and drown. Um, and they're very difficult animals to photograph. I, I'm really proud of that picture. I know if you're not into whales, dolphins and porpoises, it's not amazing. But they hardly ever show any of themselves. You just see a very little part of the back and the dorsal fin, it's all very quick and they've gone. Um, but to get a shot with one out of the water, to me, it, like, you know, lifetime's work. I've spent a lot of time trying to get that. And finally, um, a few years ago, I managed to achieve that shot in the Bay of Fundy in Eastern Canada. And then below that, 
There's a photograph of two Amazon river dolphins or pink river dolphins or botos, as they're sometimes called. And what's interesting about that shot is that the one upside down is actually peeing. It's one of the few photographs ever taken of a cetacean peeing. And I've got a theory about why they do it. I've got no idea whether this is true or not. Um, but it's an interesting theory. It would make a fantastic PhD study. So in the Amazon, as you probably heard, there's a little fish called a candy roo fish. And the candy roo fish has a habit of swimming up your willy when you're peeing. So you must, if you're, in, if you're swimming in the Amazon, don't pee. Swims up your willy, then it's got these spines like an umbrella that go doing, and it sticks in your willy. And um, very, very difficult to get out. Uh, I'm not quite sure what you do stuck in the Amazon, not easy to get to hospital and you can't chop it off. So it's a big problem. And the um, Boto, the Amazon river dolphin, maybe has the same problem. So instead of peeing underwater when a candy roo fish might swim up, it then rolls upside down and pees into the air. Fantastic PhD project, anybody who's interested. Now, finally, distribution maps. That's another whole saga. Each distribution map in the book took many, many days to prepare and um, countless hundreds of hours of research and, and work. So here's a, here's a hand-drawn, this is my hand-drawn distribution map for the grey whale. And you can imagine just looking at all the detail there, how long that took. And every little bit, you've got to decide exactly where to draw the line, where to finish, where to start. Um, and it's painstaking research, looking at lots and lots of scientific papers and talking to people in those different areas and piecing it all together. And this is the finished article, ready for the book, designer having turned my rough hand-drawn map into something looking much, much nicer. And of course, did that for every species and in many cases for different subspecies and more detailed maps for different oceans. And one of the reasons it took so long was I decided right at the beginning not to refer to other books. And I think not to criticize anybody, we all, we all make mistakes and they're bound to be mistakes in any technical book or book of this kind with a lot of facts and figures. And if you just copy, it's a sure way of perpetuating any mistakes. And I, I, I have seen mistakes in whale books that have been, you can see where they originated, you know, 20, 30 years ago, and they've been copied ever since. So what I decided to do was to go back to all the original scientific papers and put everything together piecemeal, starting with a clean slate, if you like. And there's a rough estimate. I reckon I read, and, and this is a joy, I'm not complaining about this, I read somewhere between 11,000 and 12,000 scientific papers altogether as part of the research. So, done all that, then I wrote it all up and I produced the first drafts for each species. And here's an example, this is part of the grey whale text. So these first drafts then went out to many of the experts around the world who've been studying particular species in the field and in the lab for years, or some cases for literally lifetimes. And they sent back their comments and suggestions. And without exception, they were unbelievably generous with their time and their information. And often they, they would give me facts and figures from their own research, even before they published them in their own scientific papers. And I'll always be incredibly grateful for that. Even at this stage, there were lots of quite difficult decisions. It, it, it was the semi-final stage, just finalizing everything. Because inevitably there were a bit of uh, there were differing opinions and inevitable contradictions. So even down to what you might call a particular species. So this is the what I called the Peruvian beet whale. That's what I called it in the book. But some experts wanted to call it the pygmy beet whale because it's the smallest of the beet whale family. But in the end, after lots of debate with lots of people, I went with the man who discovered it in the first place in Peru and called it the Peruvian beet whale. Well, I have to say, uh, to try and please everybody, I put Pygmy Beatwell as an alternative name. So that's all done, all those decisions made. Then the designer pulled all the text, all the artwork, the diagrams, the photographs and the maps together and started to produce a complete book. And this went through, I, I think it was probably eight or nine different versions before it was finally ready 
to go to print. This is the first spread of the, of the blue whirl you're looking at now. Not too many corrections and updates here. And actually, joking aside, this was fairly typical. There were a lot of corrections to make. And, and you know, some of the text I'd originally written several years before was it taken all those years to do the rest. So they had to be updated at this stage as well. But gradually, gradually, there were fewer and fewer corrections and updates. And the book was finally ready to go to print, as I say, five years late. And that's it. Easy. So I suppose in conclusion, my life advice for you is this. If a publisher ever sidles up to you and says, want to write a field guide? Just say no.